Hello, my friends. David Burns. Good to be with you today. Got a lot of questions to answer. You've been sending me a lot of questions in the comment sections of my videos. I feel like it's important to answer these questions because they're pretty pertinent to a time of the year where things are pretty critical. Coming out of winter, you know, we're going into uh, late winter, early spring, the time when most, really, most bees die. And so we kind of think we're out of the woods sometime, but this is a critical time when we really need to start thinking about, oh no, I don't want to make a mistake now. These questions that you've asked me uh, are really good ones, and I want to get right into these questions. Well, I have two good questions from Brad. Brad says, David, which is your favorite pollen substitute? Also, when putting some out like you did, how far should you place it away from the hive? Grateful. And he also asks, where can we get your winter candy recipe? Thanks. Well, those are really good questions, Brad. I've really used all types of different pollen substitutes from different bee companies. It works good. I've not really had any one that I didn't feel was doing a good job. Now, I'm stuck on using Ultra B from Man Lake. That's what I've been using here at the last couple of years. And I do like that. But for years, I bought a Brood Builder from Date Ant. It did a super job as well. And it seems like they're made for mixed up and the, the contents of those are just right for bees. So uh, some of you ask me, can you use um, some of the protein mix that we as humans uh, consume and eat? And I really don't know the answer to that. I just play it safe and I just get the I know I get the ones that are just made for bees and that does seem to do the trick. So now your next question was, how far away should you put it from your hives? Like I showed in the video recently. For years, I've showed a video over and over in late winter of me pouring out some pollen powder uh, out in the yard on top of a board or uh, a couple of days ago on top of a piece of carpet because I learned a long time ago that this time of the year, bees really do need uh, protein and they get it through the pollen substitute powder and I've also compared it like in my last video of sugar water versus the protein and bees are really looking for protein right now a lot of you see bees in your dog food you might see bees in your any kind of bird seed even some of you including me have seen bees in sawdust going through wood piles or sawdust piles what are they doing? They're going after minerals and protein. So at this time of the year, that's why I love to give them what they're going after. And that's really crucial. Your other question, uh, Brad, was about where do you find the recipe for our candy boards? They have always been on our website. And I've said this many times on, our, on my videos, honeybeesonline.com. And look under feeders, and then look under look up the Winter Bee Kind. They're available. You can actually purchase the Winter Bee Kinds. We've got those back in stock. But anyway, you can look under the product of the Winter Bee Kind description. Go all the way down to the bottom, and you will see the recipe that we recommend that you use. Wouldn't giving them pollen now stimulate brood rearing now, which would lead to swarming in the spring? I love this question. I'm glad you asked it. Yes, uh, I'm hoping that the pollen that I give them now does stimulate brood rearing. I want brood. I'm not afraid of having a lot of brood and a lot of bees. I'm not afraid of it in the winter time either. It's, I've done this for well over a decade and a half, and it's a very kind of success story to my beekeeping operation. If I feed bees, and if I especially keep them going strong, in the winter, late winter, with feeding them, they just come out of winter so strong. I need bees. I like bees. Now, I think a lot of times we look back and we say, if we don't feed bees, they won't make as much brood. We come out of winter. We have more time to get control of our hives and we don't have swarming issues. Uh, but here's the thing. A healthy colony coming out of winter, uh, very populated like you want them to be, very healthy, they're going to want to swarm, right? They are going to swarm. Swarming is a reproductive instinct in honeybees. If they don't or if they cannot swarm coming out of winter, that means they're not very healthy. They're low in population. There is a disease or pathogen that's making them sick, so they're not vibrant enough to reproduce. So swarming is going to happen from every colony that's extremely healthy coming out of winter. 
it is going to happen. <laughs> it's just nature's way. If, if bees didn't swarm in the spring, there wouldn't be any bees around anymore. They have to reproduce. And so if they're going to reproduce anyway, I just go ahead and make them so big that I can split them up to four times and I can really increase my number of bees. So yeah, feeding them is always going to make them stronger, healthier, but feeding is not something that's foreign to the beekeeping community. Uh, either, even looking back way back, uh, people were feeding bees. And then even looking at the last few years, we've had the introduction of a lot of different types of fondant and feeds that manufacturers are encouraging people to use in the winter time. So yeah, I think I wasn't the first or the only person a long time ago to start feeding bees in the winter time. I got the idea out of, a, I think, a 19 early 1900 book on um, making candy boards for bees in the wintertime. It, some people act like it's just a, a, a new concept and it's not, it's been around for a long time and it does help bees tremendously. So um, I really think that if you want to uh, mitigate some of the swarming in the spring, the best way to do it is just be ready for it. Uh, find out in your area, when are bees gonna swarm for you and then be ready to actually have some extra equipment ready, monitor queen, swarm queen cells, and be on top of it. And that way you can start making splits before they even start making swarm cells. So that's really important. Now, before we get into our next question, please join me for a live stream. I'm actually filming this on Thursday. So if you're watching it before the live stream, seven o'clock tonight or every Thursday at 7 p.m. Central Time, I like to have fun with my Beak Squad members. We talk, we ask questions. You can just hop on there, ask your beekeeping questions, give some feedback, enjoy the community of, of what the live stream is like. My live stream, I like to say, is a live stream with heart. And I mean that I really have a love for beekeepers. I have a love for my viewers. I really like to encourage people, motivate, inspire people in beekeeping in life. So it's a good, it's a good live stream. It's about one hour. We don't try to go much over an hour. So if you want to set your watch or your smartphone, uh, seven o'clock central time, join me tonight or every Thursday at 7 p.m. If I leave my boxes in my shed in the cold, will it kill potential diseases because my boxes are used? You know what? I'm, I'm really scared about that. Uh, used boxes really aren't that big of a deal. I mean, we kind of feel like the, the, the used equipment is more dangerous with the frames, the comb. So if you have old comb, then yeah, I think then we're worried about American foul brood spores, European foul brood spores. Uh, sometimes we're even worried about nosema uh, being in that comb. And so um, it can kind of get rejuvenated again, uh, vegetate when you put more bees in that, in that comb again. Boxes could be uh, there could be a chance that there could be uh, harmful spores of deadly diseases on your boxes, but it's a little more rare, but it can happen. And so it's, I uh, don't think that, by the way, don't think that just because they've been left for a long time in a cold shed somewhere, that it's going to kill all the bad pathogens. Remember, uh, sometimes like viruses, uh, they aren't really killed. They're not alive, so to speak, anyway, but viruses can, can survive extreme. They're stored in really extreme uh, cold temperatures. So not everything is going to be knocked down just because they're in a cold climate. If you're really worried about it, and if you, especially if you have some old comb that's been used by bees uh, before and you don't really know what they died from, they could have died from American foul brood, that the spores could still be in that comb that you're going to reuse in those frames. So number one, you definitely want to start with new frames or new foundation, at least get rid of the old comb unless you know for sure. Like if your hive dies in the winter time last year, they didn't have any problems. They didn't have any diseases. It's just, they died from starvation. Of course you can use those frames again, but if you don't know the origin or you don't know, you know, the history of the hive, why they died, you might want to definitely start with new uh, foundation and let them draw out new wax. The big thing is insulated hives. So why unwrap? Insulation keeps warm and just like your house. Do you remove the house insulation when it's warmer so the sunlight can warm it? 
I had mine wrapped with one inch pink insulation. Hive came through the winter better than ever and I had some intense weather. I'm thinking of keeping them wrapped all summer. The insulation should keep the hive cooler. All valid points, I get it. Yes, I see what you're saying. And you're having success. And I never claim that I own the corner of all knowledge. So I think what you're doing is obviously working for you and that's something you should really continue to practice and whether keeping them insulated, you know, for summer to keep them cooler and all, hey, I mean, there's other bee companies today that brag that their new product is insulated in the walls. And so that's not being taken off or removed as the seasons change. Um, I guess my, you've heard me say, and that's why you're responding, uh, that I like to remove the wrap off of a hive like yesterday when it got into the 50s. Well, I can remove the wrap you know, if it's going to be that way for a few days and let the heat of the sun hit that hive, kind of get the bees warmed up, moving into their stored honey to consume some of that honey. Um, now, the difference I will say, I'm not a heating, cooling expert. I could be way off. I could be just flat out wrong here. But my opinion is that there's a difference between a beehive and a house. I mean, you're making the comparison like we don't take the insulation out of our, out of our house. Uh, but the difference is our house is thermostatically controlled by the inside air conditioner and the heater. And so we're not really, you know, if it gets really, really cold outside, we're not going to die. We're going to turn the heater up more because, boy, you know, it's cold in here. Let's turn the heat up. Can the bees do that? Absolutely. Bees are really good at thermal regulating the inside of their hive, right? But we all know that sometimes it's so cold and our thin three quarter inch pine walls can really give a bee a beehive a run for their money. So the difference is the bees, they do have heater a heater system built into their bodies where they try to keep everything warm inside, but obviously they cluster. And so they get tighter and tighter toward each other where that's different in our homes. Uh, we, we just make the whole inside of our house 72 degrees or whatever, Fahrenheit. But in a beehive, they don't heat the inside of their box. They only heat the close proximity of each other. They try to survive in a tight ball cluster of the bees. And so we feel like if they can uh, not be so tightly clustered and they can kind of make the cluster larger, they have greater access to more stored food that they may have already consumed in the bald cluster area. And so by removing the insulation and warming up the cluster enough where they can spread out a little bit, um, you know, they can eat more of the stored food that they may not reach in a tight ball cluster. So again, you know, that's a good point. Again, my, my whole, uh, I guess, feeling about insulation is, uh, I don't think I insulated any hives at all this year. Uh, no, I don't think I didn't have any insulation on any of my hives this year, even during that 30 below that we had for two or three days. And the hives are doing fine. So I'm not a real proponent of insulation. I'm, I'm more of a proponent of really keeping a hive really strong in, in number, really heavily populated in number. I've got a video coming up where I'm going to talk about that. Uh, I, I got some good information out of Tom Seeley's book, uh, The Honeybee uh, Democracy book, and it talks about uh, how stronger, bigger hives are better. And so I, I've always felt that way. I've read, I've read some studies that were done, I don't remember what year, but a long time ago, uh, some studies were done on bees surviving the winter. And I base a lot of my winter survival on some of the things that I learned in that um, study. And they talked about how you need a minimum of 40,000 bees. They got to be strong number of bees in there to make it through the winter. I know people are overwintering nukes and single deeps and all that, but statistics, numbers, studies show that bees do better in the winter the bigger they are because that's just more heat, it's more volume. And so that's the, that's the way I do it. And again, I don't know the corner of all the knowledge or success at all, it just works for me right now. And so that's that's kind of where I'm staying. But that's, that's a good thought. I appreciate your input on this whole concept of, you know, wrapping or not wrapping. Um, obviously, we can make the argument that a natural habitat of bees are in a tree. And most trees are, what are they? Uh, when there's a hole in the middle and the bees go in there 
on a limb or the trunk is dying out and the bees go into a big vacant spot in a, in a trunk of a tree, their natural habitat, we find those walls to be three to six or more inches thick. I've got one sitting around here, but yeah, let me grab that. Yeah, so as you can see here, uh, you know, that's pretty thick right here. Um, I'm going to say a good three inches. Yeah, I think we can safely say that's three inches. And uh, you can see their entrance going in and out here. But this is an idea that, you know, a Langstroth hive traditionally is three quarter of an inch uh, thick walls. So that's uh, not even hardly half of that. So this could provide a, a more of a barrier. I don't know, I'm not going to say insulation, but a more of a barrier from the pounding cold and give the bees a little bit more protection from cold. Now, before we get into the next question, let me encourage you guys to please subscribe. It means so much to me. I appreciate it. The subscribe button doesn't cost anything. It's just a way to help you know when another video comes out that I produce to help you be a better beekeeper. And it helps my channel out. Give me a thumbs up. I appreciate it so much. Subscribe, like, now let's get back to the next question, which is now that they are raising brood, would it be a good idea to do some kind of varroa treatment? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. You know, as soon as bees start raising more brood, that means that they're going to be raising more uh, varroa mites. Varroa mites, if you're new to beekeeping, are kind of new to the idea of the, the pest that we deal with. The varroa destructor mite, it really is uh, a, a a bad thing for bees. It, it really does uh, kill off our bees. So we have to stay ahead of the game, keep our mite level down. And mites actually grow and reproduce in the cap cells of developing honeybees, in the, on the pupae of developing bees. And so as soon as we start having more brood in late winter, that's when we start seeing the queen lay more eggs and produce more brood, then we're fighting with uh, the varroa mites starting to expand as the bees expand. Now, that's true too with other things like even small honey beetle can start laying some eggs a little bit as we get into spring and beetle population will explode, varroa mite will explode. These are worse in more humid summertime, but they start growing rapidly as the bees do too. So that is a good point. And I've always said on my videos that even though I have a lot of winter bees and I make a lot of bees in the winter, I have to come out of winter and I have to go right after my mites pretty heavily. I'm doing some experiments this year. I've got several hives that I didn't treat at all last year. And so far they're still doing really well. I'm gonna find it very interesting to come out of winter and do mite tests on these hives that I did no treatments on at all to see if the mite levels grew much through winter. Even though these bees, uh, uh, I didn't feed them as much because having I, since I didn't really put a lot of um, care in keeping the mite levels down last year, I knew that if I fed them heavily all winter, that they would have more and more and more brood and it would make the mite levels go up higher. So I probably cut my feed down by at least a half, just enough to keep them alive and not make heavy brood like on my other hives that had good mite count, so I fed them more. Um, so I, I'm going to be um, finding that information out once it warms up and I can get in there and do mite tests. But yeah, um, you, you do have to start keeping after your mites right, right as soon as you can start doing inspections. If you can pull frames out 65 degrees Fahrenheit or more, then that means you can start doing a mite test. And then once you get those numbers, you can decide, do I need to treat? Did you lose any bees in your beginning of beekeeping? From two and a half years, I lose three colonies one by one, and now I ordered two colonies or packages of Carniolan. Hope this time I will get some success. Thank you for your videos for us newcomers. I watch many others keep uh, beekeeping videos from last year or more. I only watch your videos. Thanks. Well, thank you. That's awful nice of you to say. All right, let me, let me just put out a, uh, a few things about your comment there. Um, the type of bee, you mentioned you're getting a carniolan and you hope that helps you. And the carniolan is kind of known for overwintering better because they don't raise as much brood until a pollen flow starts. That's the opposite of what I want. I used to do that. I used to run carniolans. I used to run the darker gray bees like Russians and carniolans and such, uh, testing better ways to overwinter. But then I realized it wasn't so much about the type of queen, but it was more about the type of beekeeper I am. 
It's more about my management and what am I doing wrong? And so it just became apparent that I need to do better with feral mite treatments. I need to do better about nutrition and I need to make sure that my queen is a very prolific, well-laying queen going into winter. So I started replacing my queens once a year and all that. So it wasn't really, I didn't really find any success. And I, believe me, I chased it. Carefully, I chased it. I couldn't find success in the perfect queen. I even bought people's queens that made queens. And, you know, they, they actually said, this queen is better in the winter. This queen is better with mites. And this queen is better at making honey. I tried them all and I didn't see any difference at all. I'm sorry, I didn't. And so for me, I just decided, okay, it's the management of the beekeeper that really works alongside of a really good laying queen, really good nutrition, healthy colony, can brood uh, diseases down. And so I would just challenge you to realize you really need to start looking at your notes, looking at your habits of beekeeping and see if you can figure out what is it that might be leading to my bees dying like they do every winter. Am I feeding them enough in the fall to raise bees of winter physiology? And that's, uh, it takes a massive amount of sugar water for me to feed my bees one to one with protein powder mixed in, or pollen substitute mixed in uh, to that sugar water to get my bees to keep laying bees of winter physiology all through fall. Those bees live four to eight months. So that's what, that's as simple as that for getting bees through the winter. But you gotta have a good laying queen to support, you know, you feeding them more. She's gotta be able to lay. And then you gotta make sure that uh, bees don't have viruses from mites. And if you can conquer those two and not just do it, but you've gotta evaluate it. Is my feeding all this food to my bees in the fall? Do I see sheets and sheets of brood? You have to go in there and look for it. And I say you have to find four to six sheets of brood in October for me in Illinois in my fall. And if I see that, then I know that I have approximately five or six, four to 7,000 uh, bees on each a deep frame. And so you can multiply that out. And that's the numbers that I need to get me through winter, 40,000 plus or more. So then you have to do mite tests, keep your virus levels down all year long. Don't just knock them down right before winter because if you kill the mites, but the viruses can still be strong within the bees and their hemolymph, their blood and fat bodies, their feeding and, and their hypophrangial glands, mandibular glands, the food they're producing, they're passing viruses on in the food. So you gotta keep the mite level down all year long. What do you do with the leftover winter bee kind boards when you transition to one-to-one -one sugar water coming out of winter? Very good question. Um, the best thing I do is I just take them off when it's time to put my top feeders on, my Burns feeding boards on, and one-to-one -one sugar water from the top. Now, the board itself, if it still has candy in it, that's fine with me. I'll go ahead and take it off, tap it on the hive so the bees fall off, some of the candy may fall off, and then I will do one of two things. I will just knock off the excess candy that's on there and use, save my boards to be able to put more candy in them next year. Or I've been known to actually spray them with a water hose, delete the, dilute the candy down if it doesn't kind of come off very nicely. Or sometimes I just leave the candy on there and pour new candy on it next winter. In my last video, I showed bees eating a lot of pollen that I put out in the yard. And uh, the question is, how far from the hives uh, is the pollen? It's a protein uh, substitute. So, in this case, um, I have about 20 hives really farther away on the property that are my uh, YouTube studio hives. And then here, I never got to move, I never got around to moving two hives, and it's just easier for me to film without having to go in the cold way down there. So uh, these two hives here, uh, they're the closest to where I'm putting this pollen that's out in the yard. They are about 15 feet, maybe 15 yards. They're about 15 yards. Uh, from my hives. And I assume that a lot of my bees down there are flying down here as well because it looks like more bees than just from two hives. Um, so you don't want to induce robbing anytime you're feeding bees anything. Don't put the feed too close to a hive or they'll be attracted to it. So you got to be careful about that. But I would say to play it safe, you have to get it within probably uh, no closer than 15, 20 yards in this time of the year. 
Now in the fall, you want it really far away because bees are going crazy trying to find anything. Uh, the weather's still nice, everybody's foraging. And in the fall, when you feed bees, keep them, you know, 25, 100 yards away from your hives when you feed them. Just don't want to create any robbing scenarios. Another question is, will you need to add a new queen when you make a split? So a lot of you are hitting, you know, if you live in the south where it's warming up nicely, you see some dandelions already, you might be wanting to make some splits before they swarm. And so do you need a queen? Do you need a new queen? Yes and no. So uh, very quickly, if you make a split, you know, you pull out four or five frames, from a strong colony that overwintered, and you want to make a split, a new hive out of those four or five frames, I like to take the old queen over there, put her over there, and that way this hive feels like they swarm because they have to raise a new queen. Now, sometimes I have been known to just let them raise a queen because it's a very strong colony. They do want to swarm, and the thing is, by moving the queen out, they can't swarm. But it's going to take them 30 days to have the queen, a new queen, get mated, start laying and all that. But then when they get that queen starts and she's new and she starts laying eggs, they're going to go right back to want to swarm. So it doesn't solve the swarm problem. It only postpones it for about a month. So you're going to have to keep doing that if you want to make another split in 30 days. You could try that. But eventually you're going to have to use that time to manipulate these frames back at the big uh, hive that overwintered so that you can control the swarm using a in a demaray method, which I have a video on, uh, you can use different techniques, but that's the key. A new queen, good question, a new queen's always gonna get the brood picked up and laying faster. So you can buy a new queen or have a queen ready. So when you make that split, wait 24 hours in the old hive that you took the queen out of, put the new queen in there that you just bought, she's mated, and after you've taken you know, that, been 24 hours, they get, they get the idea they need a queen, Introduce a new one behind some candy in a cage, and then she's going to start laying within a few days. And so you don't lose much downtime when it comes to brood. So it's kind of like what you're wanting to do, right? In my case, I use that 30 days letting them raise a queen to help me control the mites. Mites reproduce in cap cells of developing pupae. So if I can have a break in the brood in the spring from that overwintered colony that was so robust, and so populated, then that 30 days is going to help me get a little bit a little bit better handle on my mites without using a lot of chemicals and treatments. So that works for me. Oh, do I lose? Did, when I first started beekeeping, did I lose bees? Absolutely. Doesn't everybody lose bees when they first start? I mean, probably some people don't. Uh, if you if you take a lot of classes and if you follow the important steps of beekeeping and stay really true to the things that help your bees survive, then you may not lose any bees your first year. But I would say most beekeepers really do struggle with keeping bees alive. Now, I know that in the U.S. we are looking at a very uh, different climate from very you know, deep southern states to very far northern states. The climate is just crazy different, right? And I live kind of like in the middle of the U.S. So I live like most, I'd say half the beekeepers you know, live where I live in north, and half the beekeepers live where I live in south, the further south, right? And I, I'm still amazed because a lot of people in Illinois, uh, I shouldn't say a lot, but some beekeepers I know in Illinois move their hives south for the winter. They move their hives somewhere in like Mississippi, like halfway down to the middle of Mississippi to overwinter down there. They're just trying to get them out of the harsh prairie land, uh, harsh winds of Illinois. So they'll move. They won't even go further south. They won't even go in the deep south, but they're just getting further south, right? Just to survive the winter. And so I get it. I've lost bees in the wintertime. Yeah, when I first started, remember, I've made a lot of videos showing you guys or telling you guys that my winter techniques came because I kept losing hives in the wintertime. They would come out of winter wet and dead and starved. And so I developed a lot of strategies to prevent that. I've given a lot of talks on uh, that technique that I spent years developing getting bees through the winter. By the way, talking about talks, um, I've got a, a lot of speaking engagements coming up. I've already spoken six times in six weeks in 2024. That's crazy. And then I'm going to, I want you guys to consider coming to Nevada. I'm going to be speaking at the Nevada State Conference uh, outside of Reno uh, next week, actually. So it's still time for you to register. I checked 
their website before I made this video and I saw that they're still taking registration. So if you want to just spend some time out a couple of days in Reno or it's outside of Reno, uh, fly out there, drive out there if you live close by. And it is by far the most enjoyable, I spoke there last year, it is one of the most enjoyable conferences and people that I've ever been with. The food is great, the atmosphere is just wonderful. You, you, gotta, you gotta come to this conference. I mean, they got some really great speakers. Look at these speakers right here that they have, uh, well-known speakers that you're familiar with if you've been watching uh, anything to do with beekeeping. And I really liked uh, Debbie Gilmore that puts this on and works so hard to make this a success. She treats her speakers so wonderful and um, it's just a fun time, it really is. So please consider it. I'll leave a link right here if you wanna come out and know, I know it's short notice and I've been talking about it uh, a few weeks earlier too. Uh, it's a fun time, but I've got that uh, engagement coming up uh, next week. Um, and then I've got a lot of other speaking engagements that I've already solidified as well. I, I come home from that and then I go right into another uh, conference the next week after that here in Illinois and uh, pretty full schedule on speaking. So if any of you are looking to get me as a speaker this year, my calendar is rapidly filling up. I do a lot of Zoom meetings for your clubs. So consider that. Just email uh, right here, send an email to, to this address and uh, let them know that you're interested in having me as a speaker and uh, they'll get in touch with me. One last question. Does the queen rearing course have a, any printable? I'm such a paper girl. Good question. We um, actually have, with all of our online courses, they do come with a, a worksheet. So you can hold those in front of you, read them as you're watching my videos of you, me teaching you, and you can actually fill in blanks on that worksheet and have those worksheets available when you're done. So they do come with worksheets. Now, specifically about the queen rearing course, Dr. John Zavishlock and I did actually produce a nice booklet. I don't think I have one uh, close by here. Actually, I do. Here's one. Yeah. Yeah. So we actually produced this booklet and got good pictures in it. And this is available free online as a downloadable PDF. Uh, I'll try to leave a link uh, in the description below, or you can buy this on our website, the printable copy, uh, just covering the cost of having this uh, color printed is you know expensive, but I think you can get this book. Don't quote me, I don't know my website that well, but maybe $10 or something like that. You can get the printable, we can ship that to you. But this is, this is probably what you are looking for, something that you can go buy. In fact, my queen wearing course online is pretty much based on uh, this material that uh, Dr. John Zavichlak and I put together. So I am gonna have some of these at, I'm gonna bring some out to Nevada too. So this is uh, something I think that would be good for the paper girl when you're taking your queen course. Now, if you're feeding your bees this winter and you're worried about it warming up and what do you do with your candy board feeder, your winter be kind on there, your fondant or something, is it gonna melt down? I just made a good video for you on winter meltdown. I'll see you guys over there.